Time for the 10-minute war and our good friend Mark Rogers. That's right, the one and only reasonable Ohio State fan joins us now. Good to have you back with us, Mark. How are you, brother? Steve, as you can tell from the last couple of times I've been on, I'm getting seriously disappointed in myself that I continue to hold on to that uh, that moniker, that uh, that title. So I got to say something outrageous at some point to piss off some of your Michigan audience. We'll we'll get there. I like to think that I am just presenting such reasonable and easily agreeable opinions that there's really nothing to <laughs> debate and discuss. I'm going to go with that explanation, Mark. We could do that. Sure. All right. So the schedule roulette is playing in college football. Now every conference has spoken other than the Big Ten. that We could hear from them at some point on Tuesday, tomorrow, who knows. But while we await what the Big Ten has determined, we already know, I think, a few things. To declare some definitive winners and losers in the college football schedule shuffle version 2.0. And I'd like us to go down my list of winners and losers and get your take on on each of them. And I'll explain why these teams made my list of winners and losers. And then you can tell me if you think I'm nuts or if I'm on to something. All right. So let's get to the first one. Uh, I think USC is the hands down winner, Mark. I mean, the Trojans now, they avoided they avoid an opener against Alabama, a finale against Notre Dame. They replaced those two Titans with Washington State, which has a new head coach. And right now, according to my power ratings, I've got USC favored in every game but one on its 10-game schedule. I think they are the absolute big winner. Or if you want Clay Helton gone, maybe the big loser. Well, it all depends on, as we take these teams one by one, if we're determining what are the goals for this particular team? What type of program is this? Are they, are they aspiring to, to get to a college football playoff? Are they a conference championship contender? What are they? And so for USC, were they going to beat Alabama? No. Were they going to beat Notre Dame? Most likely not. Probably a 30 or 40% shot of winning that game. So if you're just looking at best record possibilities, yes. Uh, and especially if the college football playoff committee looks at each conference, if there are no or extremely few non-conference games and give the Pac-12 a fair shake at this, yes, this is really good for USC. But the loser in this is the college football fan who's deprived the annual best cross-sectional rivalry in college football, USC-Notre Dame. And let's remember, Bama gave – USC just a bloody beatdown in 2016, 52 to six, but USC recovered from that to actually um, name Sam Darnold the quarterback a couple weeks later, go on a big run, win the Pac-12 championship, or at least get to the Rose Bowl, I should say. Washington won the Pac-12, but they finished as the best team in the Pac-12 and a top five team in the nation. So it depends how you look at it. I, I think USC, yeah, does win from a record standpoint, no question. All right, my number two winner in the schedule shuffle is North Carolina. Tar Heels, we're going to open with Central Florida, best team in the group of five, according to my power ratings, and Auburn in one of those uh, classic games, but both away from Chapel Hill. Obviously, those are two tough games, but now those games are gone, replaced by, I think, one of the friendliest draws in the ACC, including they get Notre Dame at home. So I think North Carolina is another big winner here, Mark. So North Carolina, to me, along with Tennessee, are the two most intriguing teams in the country. I want to see if North Carolina continues the ascension from 7-6 and six last year and Mac Brown and all the good that he's doing. I wanted to see these two measuring stick games, and I know that you're looking at it from the perspective of the program and that particular team. Um, certainly, stick games for this North Carolina team against Auburn and UCF. I don't think they're a college football playoff team. So therefore those two games were inconsequential um, to a conference championship. And we miss out on Clemson, North Carolina, which would have been the game of the year in the ACC, um, depending on how you view Notre Dame. Um, so again, from a record standpoint, yes, UNC uh, gains a lot from this revision of the schedule but we miss out on Auburn, UNC, and the UCF game that would have been a measuring stick to see if they could potentially play with Clemson at the end of the season. 
My number three big winner in the schedule shuffle, staying in the ACC, Louisville. It now doesn't have to play an ascending in-state rival in Kentucky. It avoids both Clemson and North Carolina in the new ACC schedule, plus two of its five road games get to be against expected league bottom feeders, Georgia Tech and Boston College. I think Louisville is a big winner. What do you think, Mark? Steve, we we almost have to... um evaluate the ACC different than any other conference because of Clemson. Clemson is so dominant over everyone else that they're just a different game. They are the automatic L for everyone. And then Notre Dame would be the assumed for me, second best team. And certainly they could play out differently, but right now second best team. And then there's this third tier of North Carolina, Miami, maybe Louisville, maybe Florida state, So, yes, Louisville misses Clemson. They miss North Carolina. NC State is the only team in the ACC that misses both Clemson and Notre Dame, but NC State is probably a non-factor. So, yes, if we're looking at a conference championship scenario to get to that conference championship game and take on Clemson, Louisville, the biggest winner in the ACC by far. My fourth big winner, as we see the mass reboot of of the schedules, Michigan and Washington. Both teams were going to have to open up against each other with untested quarterbacks and offensive lines against two of the best defensive programs in college football. We have no idea if Jimmy Lake can coach a football team, but we we damn well know he knows how to coach a defense. And so that was looking at, get, at being Dylan McCaffrey or Joe Milton's first game with four new offensive starter, offensive line starters against what could very well be the best defensive front in the Pac-12 or the second best next to Oregon. On the other hand, Washington's offensive offense, very young. And you go up week one with no camp uh, all offseason long against Don Brown and his various packages. Good luck with that. Both of those teams now don't have to worry about that opener, Mark. Again, Steve, what's the overall objective? So if it's best record, then yes, you take away by far the toughest non-conference game for each of these programs. But the the Pac-12 desperately needs respect. They desperately need to win an out-of-conference game that matters. It's been a few years since they've done that. This could have been one if Michigan would have turned around and, let's say, gone 10-2 and during a normal regular season or gone 7-2, and let's say, in the Big Ten, coming off a game in which Washington would have defeated them. Uh, The Pac-12 desperately needing the respect. I think they need games like this. But for these two particular teams, um, see, the way I see it is that if you're going to beat yourself up in the non-conference schedule, like USC does many times, we saw Alabama Notre Dame on the original schedule, then, yes, you're helping yourself out. But I, I think everyone needs that one out of three or one out of four, depending on what conference you play in difficult and non-conference games to prepare yourself for the big boys in your own conference. My final big winner of the 2020 schedule 2.0 sweepstakes, Oregon, as we stay in the Pac-12. I already had the Ducks favored in 11 of their 12 games this fall, but the one game I had them as an underdog is now gone from the schedule. Ohio State is not coming to Eugene after all, which means I've got Oregon favored in all 10 of its games this fall. If Ohio State turns out to be what we believe them to be, one of the two or three best teams in the country, and if Oregon could have played with them at home, not necessarily won the game, but played within 31-28 of Ohio State at home, and then the Buckeyes go on and go undefeated, or 11-1, and 12-1 and with a Big Ten championship game win. Then again, another Pac-12 missed opportunity here where they have failed on the big stage uh, in recent years. Two years ago, Auburn-Washington, where Washington was the projected college football playoff uh, contender out of the conference, lost a tough game against Auburn. Oregon blows a 15-point lead last year against Auburn, and then they turn out to be uh, the best representative out of the Pac-12. So, so they're, the conference is missing that game. So depending on how in-conference play is evaluated by the playoff committee, um, I see this as a missed opportunity. But, yes, Oregon's going to have a better record avoiding Ohio State. Keep this in mind, though, Mark. Last year, Oregon lost that opener to Auburn, right? If they beat yes. Arizona State, they're in the playoff, I believe. True, they are. Yeah, Utah did. I mean, Utah's marquee non-conference win was BYU, 
if they beat Oregon in the Pac-12 championship game, they're in the playoff. So just to, to keep that in mind. Yeah, they could use that that the respect that you're talking about, but I mean, this is a league that almost made the playoffs last year without its top two teams having a compelling non-conference victory. So, well, you know, BYU was well, pretty good. W- the committee would have had to make that decision between Oregon and Oklahoma or Utah, Oklahoma. Yeah. But Utah, it definitely would have chosen Utah. They were ranked the higher team going into that final weekend. So they, they definitely would have been in. Oregon and Oklahoma would have been much more of a debate. I agree with that. Let's look at the losers or the teams that I think are the five biggest losers now with the rebooted schedule. I, I think you have to look, Mark, you have to start with the entire group of five. I mean, the, you look at the the potential financial apocalypse that they are looking at without all of those paycheck games this season. If I had to guess, you're going to see a few Big 12 teams with that week one or week zero non-conference matchup they're permitted. Maybe, I don't know, maybe a couple ACC teams bring somebody in at the end of the year for a non-conference game that they're being permitted. I don't know about that, but they might get a few paychecks out of the Big 12 although Big 12 teams are scheduling FCS programs right now. But this is looking like a potential financial apocalypse for that group of five. Well, the American Conference has played so well against the Power Five in recent years. And if we look at the the breakout programs from the group of five over the, its history, over the 15 to 20 years uh, since the BCS emerged, uh, Boise State, UCF, Houston at times, uh, their reputations have been built on big wins that have that have taken the nation, college football nation, by storm, beating a big power five program. Well, we eliminate that possibility. So they're automatically disrespected, discounted, and they have no opportunity um, for that type of breakthrough. And now you're pointing to the financial end of it. Think about your average college football fan, and I'm just extending on what you've already alluded to. When do we watch group of five games? If there's a decent one on Thursday night, Friday night, um, Saturday, no. I'm not watching the group of five on Saturday. It's a Thursday night game. It's a Friday night game, a Memphis-UCF game. Sure, I'll watch that game. Um, Other than that, uh, basically, your big players on the TV front are ESPN slash ABC, Fox, CBS. Well, CBS is the SEC. The other two, uh, ESPN's really the only one that highlights the group of five at all. And most of that exposure either comes on a Thursday or Friday night, or it comes if they are playing a power five team. So basically the the group of five is going to be isolated to the ESPN, U, CBS Sportsnet type of games. And we're not going to hear much from them the entire college football season. No, we're not. Second biggest loser, in my opinion, as we look at the new schedules, let's go back to the ACC Wake Forest. Gone are three non-conference games the Demon Deacons would have been favored in. Now, one of them was Appalachian State, who's supposed to be pretty good out of the group of five, but Wake Forest would have been favored at home. But all three of those non-conference games are gone now and replaced with what 24-7 sports ranks as now the toughest schedule in the ACC. So I'm looking at this, trying to figure out who has the tougher schedule, Wake or Florida State? Well, we'll get to Florida State in a moment, yes. Pretty much a toss-up. Um they're the only two teams in the ACC to have to play what I consider to be the four best teams, Clemson, Notre Dame, Miami, and North Carolina. And so, yeah, Wake Forest uh, is a poor loser in this uh, reshuffling of having to now play, yeah, the best teams uh, in the conference. My third biggest loser for the new two, for the new 2020 schedule, I'm going to say Texas. Yes, they, you know, a road trip to LSU is never easy, but this was a completely revamped defending national champion, Mark. I think LSU, when you look at the coaching staff losses too, this is the most decimated in one offseason I have ever seen a program that didn't have a Baylor like scandal or an NCAA probation. I have never seen anything like what LSU has undergone. They've still got guys leaving. They had a guy just leave early this or leave early this week. So uh, it, it's never an easy trip, but if you're Texas, you would have had a chance to go down there with a senior quarterback, maybe ambush them early on in the season, notch a big win that kind of launched you early on with a marquee victory, and that opportunity, I think, for Texas is now gone. Texas is interesting because I, I get your point here, and I basically follow right in line with it. Uh, for all the disappointment that Texas has been, and we touched upon it last week, 
Um, the effort that they put out there against LSU last year, in retrospect, was pretty stellar. Uh, it was a game. It was a game within four or five minutes left. They lost by a touchdown. Um, the last SEC game that they played before that was the prior year's Sugar Bowl, where they trounced Georgia. Uh, Texas has the talent, the speed, the athleticism to play with these kind of teams if they're focused and on their game and going to give it a try. Um, Sam Ellinger, quarterback, as you mentioned, has played in so many big games, and he wouldn't get rattled in Death Valley. I, I think um, this is a win-win situation had Texas played at LSU, unless they lose 45-10, um, because this is a, a respect-getter, much like the Pac-12 needs for the Big 12. And, um, yeah, if they win or lose close at an LSU – uh, it's, it's a feather in the cap of the Big 12 in Texas, and, and they miss out on that opportunity. And as you say, probably a better chance at an upset than a lot of people would give them. My fourth biggest loser, let's go to the SEC, Florida. Uh, a more favorable schedule is the main reason some were picking the Gators to finally overthrow Georgia and the SEC East. Except now you want to talk about a scheduling upgrade or downgrade, as the case may be. Gone are Eastern Washington, South Alabama, and New Mexico State. That was that was seventy five percent of their non conference schedule. Those three those three teams are now going to be replaced by two teams from the perennially rugged SEC West. And other than Arkansas, there aren't really any gimmies in that division. So when you look at the new schedule that they're going to play. It's going to be those two extra games from the West are going to be dramatically more difficult than the schedule Florida originally had. Yeah, so I guess we can throw out everything we just talked about concerning the Pac-12 needing respect and to a lesser extent the Big 12. Florida playing in the SEC, who cares who you play non-conference? You win the conference, you're in. Uh, you lose one game in the conference, and even if it's the key game that takes you out of a championship game, you may get into the playoff. So, yeah, Florida could have loaded up on uh, the likes of the South Alabamas and Eastern uh, Michigans that you talked about and still played the games that it needed to. Um, and obviously the head-to-head to, uh, against Georgia probably would have been the, the deciding factor in the Eastern Division. But, um, yeah, they, they pick up two from the SEC West, which is never a good thing. And they were already playing Ole Miss, so they can't pick up, a uh, unless it's Arkansas, one of the, the lesser teams in the SEC West. So, yeah, Florida's uh, schedule gets even more difficult, and obviously LSU's always on that schedule. And then you already foreshadowed this. My final big schedule loser is Florida State. Now, they would have been number two on my list until they got a bit of a break when the SEC said no non-conference game, so they don't have to play Florida. But you already you already touched somewhat on their ACC slate. It's not just that they're playing the top four teams, Mark. They're playing, I think, Miami and Louisville, too. In fact, I've got them playing like the other top six teams in the consensus ACC preseason rankings. They got a very difficult draw in Mike Norvell's first year. Or on the flip side, you could say, who do they miss? Well, Boston College and Syracuse might turn out to be the two worst teams in the conference. Mm -hmm. Because I do think Georgia Tech is going to be better. Uh, and they missed Wake Forest and Virginia Tech. You could place them anywhere in the mid um, section of the conference standings. Uh, and then you highlighted the important point in all this is that they're having to deal with no spring practice, no individual workouts, all the things that have been missed in the first year cycle of a first year head coach. Um, that's a difficult draw for Florida State. I haven't crunched it to try to figure out if the ACC could have done better, but I think it could have been more balanced in regards to scheduling difficulty and you know I'm all about that. So before we let you go, let's let's give you um, a line into Kevin Warren's office, the commissioner of the Big Ten. Hmm. What would you if he called you up and said, hey Mark Rogers, voice of college football man, tell me what tell me what we ought to do. Understanding the reality of the situation we're in with the pandemic. All right. So within the confines of the reality we all have to play with. Give me a couple of things that you would say to him that you want to see out of this new Big Ten schedule, Mark. The first thing I want to see is the ledger. I want to see how are the finances looking? How are the finances looking projected for this fall and this 
calendar year of spring and uh, fall sports versus what you need and what you had projected in a normal circumstance? And are we looking to make up that gap to some degree? And if we are, then we need to pull out the attractive matchups. We need to double up on Ohio State, Michigan, or Ohio State, Penn State, and Michigan, Michigan State becomes the home and home rivalry. Um, I think that's one way to look at it is, is if we're dealing with reality and not just looking as football fans, what games we want to see on TV, then, then we look at the, the budgetary situation and, and how can we recoup the finances. Um, you know, I laid it out a few weeks ago in the way I would like to see it, uh, being the wild card abnormal year, the year that we don't want to see, but we might as well embrace it, as you pointed out, and let's go with this home-and-home rivalry series. Um, each team in the Big Ten generally has a rival, an arch rival, uh, that would be just tremendous to embrace a home-and-home home series across the board. But those would be the two considerations would be, um, in, in, in a real-life scenario, would be finances, and then secondarily is, is the best football games on the field and the ones that mean the most to the fans, and those are rivals playing uh, home and home. Mark Rogers, Voice of College Football. Check out his YouTube page. It's great stuff if you're a college football fan. Always appreciate you having appreciate having you with us here, Mark. We'll do it again next time. All right, brother. Take care. Thanks so much, Steve.